Welcome back to the Parasitology Lecture Series. The point of this lecture is to discuss entamoeba histolytica and the common amoebiasis. So let's proceed. So we mentioned earlier that an important complication of intestinal amoebiasis is amoebic liver abscess, and it is the most common extra-intestinal amoebiasis complication. Amoebic liver abscesses usually start as intestinal amoebiasis but it reaches the portal system through the portal veins via the hematogenous route through the capillaries, which we discussed a while ago. Once they reach the liver, necrotic patches liquefy and coalesce, forming characteristic ragged abscesses full of anchovy sauce or viscid chocolate brown pus, which contains degraded liver tissues, clots of blood, or streaks of blood. While well, majority of the contents of the abscess in amoebic liver abscesses are considered sterile, the borders of the abscess cavity are usually teeming with trophozoites. I have collated several references describing the common signs and symptoms associated with amoebic liver abscess. So we have here three studies by Hiranasuta et al., Salas et al., and Rivera et al. Abdominal pain, particularly pain in the right upper quadrant, is the most common sign or symptom associated with amoebic liver abscess. In patients with acute onset, the fever is generally present in more than 90% of the cases. The fever is often very high, and it is continuous or intermittent and sometimes accompanied by chills, weakness, and profuse perspiration. So the patient actually looks very sick. In chronic forms, the fever is slow, and develops more gradually without chills or sweating. Please take note that diarrhea is only present in about 2% of cases, with 4 to 5 episodes per day of a watery stool with mucus or blood, tenesmus, abdominal cramping, and distension due to potassium loss. As you can see, the rates of diarrhea are actually very, very broad. It really depends on the immune system of the patient as well as other comorbidities, and other situations. The point here is that the absence of diarrhea does not necessarily rule out amoebic liver abscess, but previous history of diarrhea followed by abdominal pain and fever and the other signs and symptoms here may point into a higher suspicion of amoebic liver abscess. Jaundice, on the other hand, is an unusual feature for a disease manifesting in the liver. It is reported in only 5% of cases, and its appearance suggests the existence of large or even multiple abscesses, sometimes bacterial infection, and sometimes derangement of the hepatic function. So jaundice is primarily an indicator of progressing disease. Hepatomegaly is the most important physical sign in hepatic amoebiasis. Abdominal pain, fever, and hepatomegaly would be your triad for suspecting amoebic liver abscess. The usual site of amoebic liver abscess is the right lobe, and it usually manifests as a single cavitary lesion. A number of small necrotic foci form, which would enlarge and coalesce into one big abscess. Multiple abscesses may be present, but rarely. As you can see here, the rupture of abscesses is actually a very important complication and maybe a life-threatening complication, which we should always remember when trying to deal with amoebic liver abscess. If you are highly suspecting amoebic liver abscess, try to do your imaging first before doing deep abdominal palpation as it may rupture the large abscess, if present. There is a good study by Lodi et al. differentiating amoebic versus pyogenic liver abscess based on demographic characteristics, signs and symptoms, and even laboratory findings. I'll leave this up to you to study on your own, but as a summary, males are about 2.1 times more predisposed to amoebic liver abscess. Younger age is also more predisposed to amoebic liver abscess. The presence of abdominal pain or tenderness is a good clue or amoebic liver abscess. And in the labs, higher albumin levels would point more to amoebic liver abscess rather than biogenic. But of course, 
increased amoebic serology titers, IHA, would of course point to more amoebic rather than pyogenic nature of the disease. Other possible complications of amoebic liver abscess, as well as intestinal amoebiasis, would be your pleuropulmonary amoebiasis. And this accounts to around 32% of all amoebic liver abscess complications. So from the intestines, the infection can go up into the liver, forming your amoebic liver abscess, and it can level up into the lungs from the liver to form your pleuropulmonary amoebic abscess. This can manifest as pleural effusion, amoebic lung abscess, and even empyema. Pleural effusion may develop in the right pleural cavity in association with liver abscess in the upper part of the right lobe of the liver because of their proximity to each other. Amoebic lung abscesses are usually, are usually secondary to direct spread through the diaphragm, through a hepatobronchial fistula, or primarily through hematogenous spread. It usually manifests as right basal pneumonia, which is unresponsive to your traditional antibiotics. Other rare complications of amoebic liver abscess and amoebiasis in general would be amoebic peritonitis, which carries a high degree of mortality, amoebic colitis, which has a lower form of mortality but may progress to fulminant necrotizing colitis, which carries a higher mortality rate, and other spreads such as pericarditis, abscess of the brain, balanitis, and secondary bacterial infection, which may lead to sepsis. The diagnosis of amoebiasis heavily relies on good history and PE as well as proper laboratory techniques. Visualization of the entamoeba histolytica trophozoite or cyst is important in the confirmation of amoebiasis. You can do this using direct fecal smear, concentration of formalin fixed tools or your formalin ether concentration technique, polyvinyl alcohol fixed tools, trichrome stained smears, and what you do is to, you try to look for live trophozoites in diarrheic stools or cysts in formed stools. Trophozoites are rarely found in formed stool. You may need to sample the stool multiple times as there might not be enough cysts or trophozoites present in a stool sample. And it can also be due to the inherent fact that entamoeba histolytica are really very tough to identify in your traditional microscopy setting. This is an example of an entamoeba histolytica trophozoite. This is a trophozoite here because you have your pseudopodium forming here and you also have your ingested red blood cells. And other methods of diagnosing amoebiasis can include serologic examination, which we mentioned earlier. You have your IHA, gel diffusion techniques. ELISA, immunofluorescence, and even proctoscopic examination, probably with biopsy, or aspiration of the mucus to look for hematophagous trophozoites. By the way, before I forget, serologic examination is usually good for extra-intestinal amoebiasis. Radiologic techniques can also be used to diagnose amoebiasis, particularly amoebic liver abscesses, or even pleuropulmonary amoebiasis. Ultrasound or CT scan or even X-ray can show signs that there is a presence of your amoebic liver abscess. There is your abscess here. Of course, there is your abscess here. And in chest X-ray, you can see elevation of the right hemidiaphragm, suggesting probably there is a big abscess here. The diagnosis of amoebiasis is not without its problems. And its main problem is that entamoeba histolytica is morphologically and microscopically identical to a non-pathogenic intestinal protozoan very related to it called your entamoeba dispar. So you always have to differentiate your entamoeba histolytica from entamoeba dispar when trying to diagnose amoebiasis. While direct examination cannot differentiate entamoeba dispar from entamoeba histolytica, recent molecular techniques establish them as two different species, with entamoeba dispar being termed a commensal and entamoeba histolytica being called pathogenic. And of course, 
many individuals with entamoeba infections are also colonized with entamoeba dispar. And entamoeba dispar appears to be around 10 times more common than entamoeba histolytica. In Western countries, approximately 20 to 30% of men who have sex with men are colonized with entamoeba dispar, thus highlighting the oroanal route of transmission which we identified earlier. Please also remember that the entamoeba histolytica cysteine proteases are much, much, much greater than the entamoeba dispar cysteine proteases, around 10 to 1,000 times in magnitude difference. And since we correlated entamoeba histolytica cysteine proteases in the pathogenesis of amoebiasis, the lack of sufficient cysteine proteases from entamoeba dispar would justify it being non-invasive and thus non-pathogenic. In a lot of books and workshops, it is usually highlighted that you can diagnose your entamoeba histolytica by looking for ingested red blood cells, such as this one, inside the cytoplasm of your entamoeba histolytica suspect. By the way, this is your nucleus. At least here in the Philippines, the medical technologists are not required to differentiate between dispar and histolytica based on microscopy. They only report it as entamoeba species and doctors would have to correlate the disease clinically or at least order some other laboratory tests. The problem of overdiagnosis is very true and it is a pressing challenge in the proper diagnosis of amoebiasis. Aside from entamoeba dispar, you also need to differentiate entamoeba histolytica versus the other non-pathogenic intestinal protozoans such as your entamoeba coli, entamoeba hartmani, endolimax nina, and iodamoeba bushli. These organisms are covered in a separate lecture. So why do we need to study these other non-pathogenic intestinal protozoans? The presence of these non-pathogenic amoeba in the stool of a patient is a good indicator that there is fecal contamination in that patient's food or water source. And if there is potential fecal contamination because of the presence of these non-pathogenic indicators, we might suspect that that patient is also at risk of getting other fecal oral transmitted parasites or infections such as entamoeba histolytica or even other intestinal parasites. Here is a quick summary of the life cycle of, of the non-pathogenic intestinal protozoans, you have your entamoeba coli, entamoeba hartmani, entamoeba polechi, sometimes, endolimax nina, and ayudamoeba bushli. And basically, their life cycle is that you ingest them, they pass through your system, they probably stay there a while, and then you excrete them, and then it contaminates the surroundings and infects another person. Quite a simple circular life cycle. In terms of morbidity and mortality, amoebiasis is second only to malaria in terms of protozoa-associated mortality. And we mentioned from a previous lecture that malaria is the number one protozoan which causes mortality globally. However, you should also take note that asymptomatic intestinal amoebiasis occurs in 90% of infected individuals. So most individuals don't even know that they are infected with amoebiasis. Only 4 to 10% of these individuals with asymptomatic amoebiasis at one year of monitoring would eventually develop into colitis or other complications such as extra-intestinal diseases. Amoebiasis is also fourth in morbidity behind your blood flagellates. And the combined prevalence of amoebic colitis and amoebic liver abscess estimates at around 40 to 50 million cases annually worldwide, resulting to around tens of thousands of deaths. The main premise in the treatment of amoebiasis is you have to treat the site or sites of infection. And these can be done through the use of one or more types of amoebicides. You have your tissue amoebicide and your luminal amoebicide. Your tissue amoebicides include your chloroquine, emetines, and your metronidazole, with metronidazole being the most common one, while your luminal amoebicides include your diloxanide furate, iodoquinol, 
and paromomycin. If you are suspecting an intestinal amibiasis, you always have to give your luminal amoeba amoebicides to kill off, of course, the trophozoites and the cysts residing in the intestinal lumen. If you have invasive amoebiasis, that is when you give your tissue amoebicides, more commonly your metronidazole. Again, you only give your tissue amoebicides if you are suspecting invasive amoebiasis, which includes your amoebic colitis, amoebic liver abscess, pluripulmonary or lung, lung amoebic abscess, brain abscess, and other extra luminal amoebiasis. But please do not forget to treat the luminal amoebiasis. Let's say you treated your amoebic liver abscess with metronidazole only. However, the amoebic liver abscess was a secondary extension of a luminal intestinal amoebiasis. Your metronidazole will not be able to kill the luminal, luminal infection. And even if metronidazole resolves the amoebic liver abscess, it may recur since the primary infection in the lumen is still present. Control and prevention of amoebiasis is quite simple. Proper washing of hands with soap and water, trying to avoid contaminated food and water. If you are unsure of the quality primarily of drinking water, boil them first before drinking them. Safe and hygienic sex practices. Mechanical vectors can also be causes of outbreaks or infections. And in the public health setting, food safety initiatives are very important. These include food handler education, and proper screening, and of course, routine inspection and grading of food establishments. Here in the Philippines, we have the Sanitation Code of the Philippines very, very recently enacted. And in Section 15 and 19 of this code, it says that no person shall be employed in any food establishment without a health certificate issued by a local health authority which shall be issued only after the required physical and medical examinations are performed at prescribed intervals. Currently, there is no mention of a stool examination as a requirement, and the risk of this is that food handlers may carry pathogens without exhibiting symptoms, as we mentioned earlier. In cases where stool examination is a prerequisite, the usual practice is examination of only one sample using direct fecal smear or DFS, which has a very low sensitivity. But on the upside, Guidelines for parasitologic screening of food handlers are currently being developed by a multi-agency technical working group, and the Philippine government, as well as topic experts, are pushing for the use of stool concentration technique as a requirement, proper accreditation of laboratories, and certification of proficiency of laboratory staff. So proper implementation of health policies is actually very important in the battle against amoebiasis. As a last note, here are the different cysts and trophozoites of the different amoebae that we've been talking about earlier. Please focus on this column here for entamoeba, histolytica, or dispar. And as my last slide, here are beautiful pictures of entamoeba histolytica trophozoites. And that's the whole point of this lecture. Hope you learned something. Thanks for watching. If you learned something, feel free to share this video. And don't stop learning.